We have uh, Nick Hills uh, from True Clarity. So, round of applause, please. Thanks for coming and watching. Um, today, the, the sort of talk I was going to do was all around the sort of stuff we've done recently with some of these guys. So, over the sort of past few years, we've done quite a lot of cycle projects, all for various different clients, types of sort of businesses. But the, the, this one was kind of the first where there was a real focus that we need to use the page editor. So it's going to be a kind of mixture of talking about some of the ways we, we kind of solve some of the problems, some of the stuff you can do, what you can't do, all those kind of things. So it's a bit of a case study, it's a bit of a, a sort of talk through really what you can do with it. So yeah, my name's Nick Hills, I work for a company called True Clarity and we're, we're based over in Bristol. There's a few of these guys, a few of our guys here, so it's quite good to see our, uh, sort of friendly faces. Um, we've been doing, doing these kind of projects for sort of five or six years. Um, the first few didn't go quite so well, but as we've sort of found our feet, we've done some pretty neat ones over the last couple of years. So, I'll just talk you through kind of what we'll have a look at. So, the, the sort of focus of the page editor really is something that sort of, I, we noticed a lot of clients weren't really bought into or there wasn't really much focus on exploiting it. Because the, the sort of the people that we were working with often were quite technical. They didn't really need to, to have that WYSIWYG kind of interface for doing all the sort of operations and that kind of thing. Um, so the, the, the sort of key elements that I've picked out based on, on our experiences were really, from a sort of developer's point of view, how do you go in and actually sort of make the page editor work? How do you tell it what to do, what to show, all those kind of things and, and manipulate the data? The second one's really, how do you actually pick the data to show? Because you've got, I mean, your tree is huge, you can, you can have stuff all over the place. And then the last bit is sort of looking at a few bits where we kind of got unstuck, just some slightly odd things that we run into kind of over the, over the project. Now, the, the, the one that we're going to have a look at today is, like I said, it's for a company called ASOS. So they, the project we worked on was a team of, I think there was probably about 50 50 or so editors, which is a huge amount more than we'd ever really worked with before. Um, typically, we'd, we'd deal with kind of one or two guys in the past. They would send out emails daily, sort of saying, these are our new products, these are our offers, these are our vouchers, all these kind of things. And I think the real, the, the, the real big thing we noticed was that they're very non-technical users. They weren't kind of the normal guys we work with that, that would have a grasp of the content tree and would be happy sort of drilling up and down through those, that sort of aspect of it. So then the, the, the way they actually send these emails, it didn't, it didn't actually make use of the, for example, like the, the email campaign manager. It, they sent it off through their own bespoke sort of CRM system. So I think that's probably worth, uh, worth just mentioning. So just to give a sort of uh, an idea of what this sort of thing looks like, here's a couple of example emails that, that they'd send out. So they, I mean, they, they have a huge sort of customer base and and sort of resource pool that they'll send send these emails to. It's they go out to the UK, to, to France, to um, probably five or six other languages. Which don't, don't put me on these guys. Probably know better. But it's, I mean, it's, it's not just it's not just straightforward English content. Um, it's all being translated. It's all being sent out um, to, to a huge user base. Now the kind of the the key sort of elements that we've built up around this sort of project and it'd be worth just talking through a few of these are based around kind of a couple libraries we've built in-house that really we found helped save us quite a lot of time throughout the, the development. So the first one that, that we, we sort of hook into a lot in, in, in all of our projects is the notion that you can use link cycle. So rather than having to kind of bind and, and actually sort of iterate through items through your dot children and things like that, it'll actually expose essentially dot like items or descendants and all this kind of thing, but all using deferred execution. Now where we find that comes into its own is once you build more and more of these kind of queries up, you can then chain up your link queries and you can do all this kind of thing. So you can do actually quite powerful statements without really having to write much code. And it kind of saves, saves you having to dive too much into the API if you're, as we're kind of teaching up and kind of bringing people up to speed. The next one I think that, that we've really found benefits from in, in this example project was uh, the, the notion of S control. So we built up kind of renderings or sub layouts in, in these examples that knew the data that was around them. 
So you don't have to do the kind of plumbing day in, day out of, right, this sub layout needs to show this data from here, blah, blah. And as that carries on down through the tree, you're doing the same thing kind of again and again. So where the S controls helped us out was you can essentially use the same markup, think of it like a view or a, a XSLT kind of idea, and it will just pick up what data it needs to show and you just bind very high up and the rest ripples down through. The, the agility pack is pretty integral to the way the cycle works. They, they use it themselves quite a lot in within sort of APIs and things like that. I don't know if you've worked with, if you've ever done anything with emails that need to get sent out before, but it's somewhat archaic in that you can't really work with some of the newer web technologies. You've got to deal with things like tables, TRs, TDs. You can't make use of your divs and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so the, we, we kind of made use of the agility pack to glue all this stuff together and essentially bend the content when we couldn't get the cycle to work quite right with, with the way that sort of the, the table structure needs to be. And then finally we had a bit of Windsor in there to, to glue some of the stuff together. In the last slide, it just touched on the, the notion of desk control. So we've got a, a circle tree here. It's not, I mean, there's, there's not a huge amount of content being shown, but each kind of level in the, the blue bit we can see is, a set, is bound into a different set of information. And now the way that the, the S controls kind of exploit this notion is you might bind, for example, at this level, the quite high up into a repeater, and then all of the children items would kind of infer or, or be able to work out what they're supposed to show. So rather than you having to go through, push the right data into the right points to show the same sort of thing, the grunt work essentially is taken out of your hands by, by this sort of idea. You see, I mean, it's something that we've used in, in several projects, and we found it's actually, I mean, it, it makes the development quite easy. It, it just glues everything together without you having to do very much, which I think is, it saves you quite a lot of time, really. So, a bit of, bit of an intro. The, the next step, really, is to, to sort of show some of the, the UI elements that really we kind of exploited and made use of throughout, throughout the project. Now, you've got within this namespace, the web controls one, well, there's, there's quite a lot of controls that you get. I mean, they, they pretty much do what they say on the tin. The one that I think is the most interesting, or the, the one we exploited the most in this, at least in this, this example, which I'll show a lot more on, is something called the edit frames. And, I mean, if, you, if you've worked with sort of the newer versions, chances are you would have actually used these kind of things, but possibly without realising. And, here we go, we've got an example of exactly what an edit frame looks like. So if you're in the page editor and you're, you're trying to kind of manipulate your renderings, your sub layouts, all these kind of things, edit frames give you this route up and down through your control hierarchy essentially or through the sort of nesting that you've got. And what we've gone and kind of exploited in this example is really adding a lot richer functionality into to this kind of thing. So in the sort of the, the, the olden days, one of the things that the tree was very good for is was giving you the, the your sort of crud operations, your moving items up and down, your um, adding and, and sort of deleting things, shifting things about, and all that kind of thing. So what we've you really used edit frames to show is that this sort of data can be exploited from a user's perspective in this particular environment, not having to kind of dig into tree and, and have a look around and all that kind of thing. If, for example, you want to go in and add your own buttons or start to configure your own edit frames, then you need to dig into the core database and find this path here. So within applications and then web edit and then edit frame buttons. And so within there you can set up your own folders, set up your own buttons, write in your commands and all that kind of thing. And I think that the, the reason that I wanted to highlight this was back in the day when I did the course, I don't think these things existed, so it was quite a good thing to sort of, uh, to, to be pulled up and to find out about it really. So on, that, on, on kind of when you set up your own custom edit frames, you, you build up this kind of functionality, you've got a couple options for what you can actually add to and how you can configure them. If you look at the previous screen, then <coughs> things like the up and down, 
um, this sort of idea of these buttons are really to, to allow the user to manipulate the items, shove them up and down the tree, pretty much like you would from within the normal UI. And the way that that's glued together is through the notion of commands. So cycle <coughs> commands you can bind to the click field, and you've got then either your out-of-the-box cycle ones or custom ones that you want to sort of come up with. The other button it's worth mentioning is if, for example, you're, you place your edit frame around uh, a, a news article within your tree, then on your news article you might have fields that aren't shown in the UI that you want the editors to be able to, to manipulate and change. So I guess examples might be the, the, the date that something's going to be available or um, sort of meta information that isn't necessarily there showing to the user that you could kind of type in line. Now where these, these other buttons come into play, you can specify this list of fields. If those fields exist on the item you're editing, then through one of the edit frame buttons, that's kind of available to you to, to go and edit. So then that gives you the power over things like multi-lists, uh, tree lists, kind of anything that doesn't really make sense to manipulate there and then in the actual, uh, in the actual user interface. Now that's all well and good, the, the kind of basics that, that we've seen there. If you're just manipulating a single item or if you're manipulating quite simple data. Now I think where we, where we found we pushed this a little bit further than we'd really ever done before was actually building up quite a deep tree of, of several edit frames running down through the page. Now that gives you the kind of ability to edit content that's very, very kind of rich and deep and all those kind of things. And we didn't really run into problems with the fact that you had edit frames within edit frames within edit frames and so on. So I think that the, the thing I'd say you take away, if, if anything, is that you can push this as far as you want to go, especially if, if your controls are very kind of generic at each point. It's very easy to then reuse essentially the, the sort of configuration that you've got for each, uh, for each level. Another, another sort of thing that we we hadn't really found much success with before was really how to work with <coughs> sets of data. So whether you work with actually I sort of several items in the tree, or whether you work with with multi lists and things like that. And the way that that kind of glued together was really through through using branches. And I'm not sure if, if people have ever used this kind of thing. It's in the olden days. It's kind of masters was sort of the original version of this. Branches kind of take that that theory on. I think I quite good. At, analogy is if you need to create say a, a sort of calendar month and year and that kind of thing a branch would give you the ability to create say the year that you want to add and then it would fill all the months up for you so you're, you're, you're creating several items in one fell swoop you're not just creating like you would kind of I just want to add a news item or well, that's, a, that's a thing. Another area that we sort of pushed a little bit more was, was really sort of digging into the, the notion of commands so you've got all your out-of-the-box commands if you've ever Done any stuff? We're actually using the UI to manipulate things. There's a big set of commands that you can find out from from the kind of commands.config file. But we actually kind of took took this principle on and, and built quite a lot around this, just really customising a lot of the functionality that was exposed for, for all the editors to use. <coughs> now there was one slightly strange behaviour that we found. Um, it may be that you never run into this. If you do, hopefully you'll think back and you'll say, actually, yeah, right. I, know, I, I know why these buttons are disappearing for seemingly random, random reasons. So you, you, you have your sort of set of um, the buttons in, the, in, in your edit frame. And what we find was on different environments, seemingly for different items, suddenly two or three of the buttons would disappear without really much kind of rhyme or reason. And it took a bit of digging around, quite a lot of help from support, and ultimately we found that at the point it kind of evaluates whether it should show these buttons or not, it, it calls into what's called the query state. And depending on whether an item was locked or not, would determine whether the button would be hidden, disabled, or available to, yeah. to use. The, the problem that we then found with the, the edit frames was if buttons were disabled, they wouldn't be disabled, they disappear. So, if you ever spot that, I did write a wee bit up about it on my, on my blog if you want to find a bit more information. So You may never run into it, but if you do, there you go. Hopefully that will 
ease your uh, debugging. So, let's have a look at what it all means. So here we've got an example of if the, essentially the page edit we've set up for, for the ASOS guys. Now, it, the, the reason that all the sort of cells are very grey is this is kind of a base item that then they would copy out and build up kind of more incarnations of. Um, so if we have a look at what we've got on this guy, here we're just rendering out essentially a text field, so using the, the cycle text uh, web control. And your default behavior you get, for example, things like your rich text controls. Um, you get the ability to kind of manipulate media within the item. The interesting one here now, if we look at the, the sort of structure that we've got, there's actually quite a lot going on above this bit of text that we're on. Um, so as we work our way up, now we can see something that's a bit more like the kind of example we saw. So we've got the notion of our own custom custom buttons that you can add in. So these are these will all run cycle commands. So move the item up, just taps into the normal cycle one. Um, move the item first, uh, does exactly the same. The one for adding a new item and for uh, deleting the items, we, we had to customize slightly to work around a couple issues with sort of picking the right context. But it's essentially it's, you, you can still make use of the out of the box cycle <coughs> commands. And then this first item gives us the ability to edit the properties. Oh, rats, it's gone wrong. We'll find a better one. Let's go up another level. Um, da, 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 da. Sorry about that. This might be a better example. There we go. So the, the, the first type of button that I just kind of touched on in, in the slides was you can specify the fields that you can then choose to edit when you, when you hit this kind of thing. So what we've done in this, this example is we can see we've got these three fields, content style, link style, and, and content color. Now it might seem like this is a bit, a bit OTT. Why, why would you, why would you allow, me allow a user to do this kind of thing? The, the answer in this case was within the scope of kind of the work we were looking at here, the, they had different people that would concentrate on who, on what, on how things would look versus what the actual content should say. And so this, the, by using this kind of technique, um, what we've done is we've, we've given a specific user the ability to edit, for example, the style of this content, or how the links are going to look, or the colors, all those kind of things. Um, whereas someone else, depending on their roles, can come in and, and happily kind of edit their text, all within the, the scope of this kind of UI, so without, without need for, for even knowing the tree exists, essentially. You've got a couple ways then, once you sort of set this, this sort of stuff up and you build these nestings, you've got a couple ways of, of sort of navigating up through these. Either you can make use of this tree structure or in its simplest form you just you work your way up. And you can see the kind of selection area that we're working to is growing as we're working our way up through these controls. The way we sort of found we could solve this was by all these items knowing their context, knowing what's around them. We didn't really have to wire anything in. We could just bind the data at this high point here, and the rest would just ripple its way through. So it meant from a sort of development point of view, this kind of thing was very easy to then take and reuse the same sort of style of content um, elsewhere within... Oh, I'm just going to find an example now, but I'll, find, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that and find one, find one slightly later on and, and, and show you. So the, the, the next bit I thought it was probably worth just mentioning how you how you configure is the ribbon. So the, uh, this is something that's quite common to all your Microsoft products. You've got the toolbars at the top. Uh, within the content editor, you've got essentially the same sort of thing. You've got the notion of the ribbon. So if you want to go in and, and add your own buttons, build your own functionality in, then again, you need to dive into the core database. And have a look at this, this this folder, and in there you've then got all these kind of chunks that you can add your own buttons to, and you can start to build up build up custom functionality. So the, the one in this example was this notion of distribute. <coughs> the, the guys at ASOS would take the markup they generated, so they take their kind of finished 
email, and then they'd be able to distribute it, which would essentially scrape out the HTML from the page, which they could then send off through, through their CRM tool. Um, one of the other things that was actually kind of built into this process was the notion that we'd scrape out all the media from the page and bundle this all into a zip, so that then their, their third-party application would have all the images at the right paths, we'd kind of rebase all the HTML and all those kind of things to build essentially a distributable entity that could just be sent off and, and go on its merry way. A bit like with the, the edit frames, you've got a couple of types of buttons you can add. It's, I mean, it's not the most interesting of sites, to be honest, but essentially it proves you can, you, once you've got your commands, you've got this kind of rich set of functionality that you can exploit. So you, you, you can use the out of the box ones, or you can start to build it your own. In the, the, your sort of default setup, so your vanilla sidecore, if you dive into this file, this commands.config, then within there is all of the UI commands that actually work within, within Sitecore. And if you want to find out kind of what happens when you press a button or what happens when you perform certain interactions, if you know the command that runs, you can then dive into this file, have a look at the code that runs, and work your way into, into the functionality. So something like Reflector or IELSPY will give you that view if you're working at your C-sharp level. If you actually want to go in and you don't really know what's happening within the UI, then if you take something like Firebug, just show you <laughs> quickly. No. Oh, C. <laughs> Cut off. Um, so yeah, if you've got um, something like Firebug installed, and you want to know, for example, what happens when you hit uh, move up, although that's probably not very good, less two, or less, let's find a better item in the tree. So say you're on a specific node somewhere in the tree and you want to know, oh, maybe it'd be quite useful to, to tap into what up does, then what you can do is if you inspect the HTML for the button, it takes a little while to, to find it, then what will happen is, it, it's going to raise on the click of that button, which unfortunately it was pretty small. Oh, no. Apologies, I don't know quite how to zoom firebug. But I promise you, it says scform.post event, this uh, comment event, and then item move up. So once you know this item move up, that's really the glue that you want to then dig into your commands file. And that'll start to show you exactly the code that's being run at the point you press these buttons. And so I found that this, this kind of thing works pretty well throughout the UI, that with a bit of kind of digging around, you can then find really how any of the, the, the out-of-the-box functionality works. Once you've got that hook, once you've got the, the, the actual command name, you then are pretty much at the API because you, you just need to look up the, 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 the sort of link which, is, which all lives in this commands file. There's a few other things you can do from this point. Either you can uh, you can actually manipulate all your items, so you can you can move, you can manually delete things, you can manually move things, you can iterate through the tree, you can check the template, something, anything that you think you can write in the API. When once you kind of built your commands, you've got that available to you. If you need to build up a bit more sort of UI interaction, you can evaluate JavaScript, so you can you can use the sheer response to to kind of run specific scripts that you've done. Um, if you need to prompt a user to OK something or, or kind of cancel their input, all these kinds of things. It's like it says there, you, you can invoke this custom code, you can, you can run your pipelines. Really, it's what, what you can think of that you might, you, might be able to, uh, you might be able to write, you can then chain off, um, chain off the commands. So far, I think we've looked really kind of, for a developer, how you can just configure what a user can do. Um, the, second the second bit of that puzzle, I think, is, is telling these controls, these text controls, these edit frames, actually, what, what data am I going to feed? So, I mean, there's, there's, there's hundreds of ways you can set up the tree to support 
to support these kind of things. In these examples, we really wanted all of the data for an email as children of it, so that it, it's very contained, it's a singular entity. We didn't really need the notion of shared adverts, of shared um, sort of navigation elements. The two ways that sort of cycle glues the, the that data that you, you're configuring into exactly your specific components is either through data source, which is kind of the more common route, or alternatively, you can you can make use of rendering parameters to kind of chain some of this stuff together. But that's that has a slightly different um, diff different function. Within the the ribbon, you've got. Um, the ability to essentially to say, right, I want to add, add some new components into the page. And one of the sort of newer additions in, in some of the more recent versions is this essentially select associated content. Now, where this, the, where this really improves on the old sort of style of, of adding these kind of things is you're much more sort of guarded as to what data you can add. You, you're forcing the user to pick from a specific place. So in this example, we're We've, we've added in this sort of queryable data source just to build on that, to, to force the user to, to, to pick that you can only add items from below a specific place. Um, and you can also, I don't know if you can notice, but some of these items are in bold or black and some of them are kind of greyed out. So what we're also doing is we're restricting the fact that if a user is going to go in and add a pixel banner in this example, they can only add the right type of data. So it doesn't really make sense that they can add the sort of footer address to a, to a control we've made that's supposed to show a grid of content and things like that. There's one slight bug there, I think, that we run into with this kind of thing a fair bit. And when you sort of build up these data sources and glue them together and pick essentially what data feeds into, into sublayouts, it's, it's stored as the path to the item rather than the GUID. <coughs> um, so it's worth being aware that if, for example, you rename a node quite high up in your tree, there can be a big ripple through effect that some of the, your children items won't actually tie up anymore. There's ways around it that, that you can either use the rule engine to kind of do some funky stuff, or you, you, at the point that they rename items, you kind of rebase some of this stuff. But it's, it's, it's easy to come unstuck by, and I think that was kind of one of the, the main pain points we had throughout this, uh, throughout this project. So this, the, 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 the few slit items here sort of touch on things I mentioned on the previous slide. If you're going in and you're setting up a sub layout, so you're, you're saying, here's my new sub layout item. <laughs> you can see here, this is the template that it's based on. And there's three fields, so the three sort of key items that I think that, that we've made use of a lot within this is, A, your parameters template, so that gives you your rendering parameters. The ability to configure how that sub layout is going to work or to tell a sub layout it might want to show a certain height, these kind of things. The next one, this data source location, that's the glue really for saying where am I going to look up the data, where, where will I find all of the sort of information that I want to show through, through our sub layouts. And finally, the last one, the data source template, that gives you the ability to say, when I add one of these sub layouts, I don't want to let them add a grid to a pixel banner or anything like that. You can build these rules in to, to sort of guard against what the user can do. <coughs> I've put a link down at the bottom here, which, which is quite an easy one to track down. If you search for the queryable data source, the extension that that gives you is the ability to pass cycle queries in as the essentially where the data source is set. So rather than it being an explicit point in the tree, so your adverts folder or your um, news item archive, things like that, what this gives you the ability to do is say, we'll pick from, like in this example, we'll expose the user to only be able to pick from its children item. So here we can see we're on this email, and the user's given the ability to pick just the, the, the items that are below it. So let's have a look at that kind of thing. So we'll just dig into some sub outs we've got. And it sounds like a simple thing, a space row. Essentially, the, the user's the ability to add rows 
sequentially down through the email markup. And if I show you exactly what one of those would do, if we go to edit the component properties, the rendering parameters here are giving us the height that essentially the HTML row is going to be. So if we bump that value up, and you can see now we've got slightly questionably crappy looking email, but we've kind of shown that the data you set within the UI can feed straight into your controls. You, you do need to kind of cast the control you're on to a certain thing and, and, and query into that data, but that's all available to you through page editor. This, I mean, they, they, they can add these rows in kind of as and where they want, all that kind of thing. The other one, <coughs> if we then take, um, for example, some of the other ones, then what we're saying here is that if we go in and, and prompt the user to add, for example, a header button, things like that, then here we're making use of this, this data source, um, the, the data source query, and you then just pick the template of the item that you want to allow the user to pick from. So let's go back to my page and show you what kind of thing that means. So if we work our way up to sort of root level, fortunately there's, there's it's, I mean it's quite cosy, but with a bit of delicate <coughs> you can kind of find your way around. What we're seeing here is through the fact that we're, we've got a placeholder on our page called, uh, I think this is probably the email body, something like that. Within Cycle, we've set up the rendering parameters, uh, sorry, not the rendering parameters, the, the placeholder settings, so that then when you choose to add something to that, we say, right, you're allowed to pick from this pool of, of different things. So here we can see we can we can pick any of these sort of items to choose to add in. So let's go for the grid, because that's probably one of the slightly more advanced things we've got. We've now got this set of items sort of proposed to us that we might want to pick from, but it's actually saying, right, none of these are sorry, none of these are valid. It's we've told them that the only thing you can add to this uh, to this sub layout is the grid. So whether you'd actually want to add kind of a duplicate of what we've got down below probably doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but exposes the fact that you can you can kind of pick from an existing pool of stuff. Alternatively, if you want to go in and add add new ones, then what we'll do is we'll say, okay, right, we're going to add in add in some new content. Choose the name. We'll, well, we'll be happy with it being called the grid, and choose okay. And what we're now seeing is a very kind of basic sort of pre-canned version of what we're seeing below. There's just a lot less in it. Now the reason that that we've achieved sort of the, the tree structure that I'll show you in a sec So the reason that we've got this cell already created is because what we've done is we've made use of something called a branch, which I touched on before. So when we actually chose the option that was kind of add new content, not only have we created the folder, which is kind of the grouping for all of these grid cells. Um, this one probably shows it slightly better in that if we have a look at this grid we've got, we've got loads of kind of the notion of grid cells running down the page. We've been able to create this folder, but then also children items, or as many children items as you want, at the point you kind of, you, you invoke the create item. So there's, there's probably some of the, the last points just to touch on. I think these, these sort of sum up some of the slightly odd things that we run into and some of the real sort of challenges with doing this kind of thing through page editor. So for us, it was trying to make mean that we don't have to touch the content tree. These guys, they don't care about how the tree's set up. The slight problem was then that you're working with tables, with TRs, TDs, and some of the page editor didn't actually work particularly well if you tried to dynamically add in table rows. So as this, the, the page is growing, as they, that spacer row is the example, um, what we found we had to do was slightly heavy-handed attack on essentially what the markup was going to show. But if we're working in page editor, essentially the glue for all of this is this 
rewrite these tables to this, which wasn't great, but we kind of took agility pack and made it a piece of, well, a piece of paste, basically. You take the entire markup and you find your tables, you find your TRs, and you just transform them to be divs. That means page editor can kind of work happily. We can write our markup so it's exactly the same as kind of the guys gave us. The, to, the real focus was that we didn't have to, or the, the, the output from the distribution functionality really needed to match the sort of markup these guys are giving us because they, they tried and tested this to the nth degree. We didn't really want to have to go in and test this in how many email clients you, you can think of. So what we wanted to be able to do was write our code in, in tables. Well, we didn't, but we had to. <laughs> um, to write it in tables, in TDs, all these kind of things. At the point this was then shown to, sorry, at the point this was shown to the to the page editor, we just kind of bent it a little bit and, and, and took it down down our own route. Um, it wasn't quite as straightforward as that. We did need to kind of build in some areas where we'd sort of block off this sort of functionality, but if, I mean, I can show you, if anyone wants to have a look, come and just shout afterwards and I'll, I'll kind of run you through that. Um, another slightly interesting one that caught us out was to do with the preview user. It's, sort of, it's the sort of thing, it, it felt like it makes sense now you now we sort of know why it was happening. Um, obviously when you run into problems, you don't really know Kind of what's going on, that sort of thing. So, if, if we find sometimes we, we built this custom page to give the, them the ability to kind of copy content into different languages. So, being we were trying to be kind of lock it down, be vigilant about the fact that not all users could could access this page. And so we said at the start of it, if if they're logged in and they're a certain role, right, they can see it, brilliant. If they're not, they just get a blank page. So that kind of felt like quite a sensible thing to do. Sometimes, without really realizing or knowing why, the page would be empty and we'd kind of, well, we're logged into Cycle as the admin user or as, as your Joe Blogs user. Why the hell aren't we being able to access this, this sort of content that we've set up? There's a strange sequence of events, which, like I said, does kind of make sense when you, when you think it through. But if you're on a specific item and you choose Preview, you're viewing the site essentially as a user would be coming in from the internet. So you're not the user that you were five seconds ago, which I think was what we kind of got stuck by. So what's actually happening behind the scenes is when you click this button, as part of the command that this is running, it's it's changing the context of the user that you're you're running as. The key point working back from that, if you ever find this kind of thing, was this preview manager.restore user. So this gets run when, for example, you go into page editor, various other things like that. So we need to make sure that when we fired up our pop-up and, and, and loaded it in, that we made sure that that user was back back to the same user that they were before, otherwise they, they'd see nothing. We had a quick look at the, the distribute functionality before. So we knew at the point that you'd hit Distribute. Um, let's go into email. So yeah, we know at the point we hit distribute, essentially which item you're on. But the challenge that we found was how do we actually get the HTML for it? So the sort of simplest way we found for doing that kind of thing was to make a web request back in, sort of scrape out the content of the email. So really view this page as if you were coming in from a browser. So take the HTML from here. Build it into those zip packages that we that we showed got exported, and then kind of rewrite using the agility pack, pull out some of the crap we don't want, get rid of the view state, all those kind of things that that might have creeped in through the fact that we're using web controls and that sort of thing. Similarly for the media, it for each image that we found, just make a little request, get those out, and build them into the zip. And it's all very once we kind of arrived at that way of solving it. By using pipelines, we could step through very easily all this markup that we got. You're working with a string, so it's very easy to test the stuff. It's, you've got a string in, you've got a string out. You're just manipulating, really, the attributes, the style tags, the classes, all those kind of things. Um, 
The next one I think is probably worth mentioning is this ensuring the page is saved. Now this was something that we didn't really, I guess, until you, you run into these sort of problems, you wouldn't expect that this would kind of be an issue, but what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll just we'll edit this text that we've got on the title here, but then we'll go down and we'll say we're going to make use of some of the other functionality we've done, which allows you to fill up this cell with data from an API that they've got. What, if, they, if we kind of ran through this process and it was successful, we'd be then pushing data back into the tree, we'd be filling in which image was showing, we'd be filling in, for example, the description, these kind of things. But the page we're sort of coming from was in this kind of, not invalid, but in the state that we needed to make sure we saved it. So if you need to, even these kind of things you can kind of guard against by just sort of being careful about what you're detecting when you fire up your pop-up. So if we choose to save it, and we'll just do that. then what we can do is we'll see if we go up again, then now we've got the pop-up and we can start to pull in data from the API if I haven't got uh, any internet going here, so it's not going to be much. Probably just hang there to the point of um, I think the last one that we'll, that we'll touch on is just this, this restricting the color palette. So, the idea really behind that was that they had different people that were involved with editing the content, with choosing the styles, all those kind of things. And so through, through a combination of kind of different page edit configurations, um, different ways of structuring some of the content, we can allow, only allow certain people in, in, in given roles to a, create these styles, to, um, to pick which styles are available, to pick um, the, the sort of heights, all these kind of things, and then different people that their focus is kind of making it very fluffy and sell, and making it very sellable. They can kind of take up, take that on, and, and deal with themselves. So that's the last slide. Yeah, thanks for watching. We didn't make use of any of the DMS in this. No, no, no. Custom experience buttons allow you to do the same functionality that you're using to edit frames. Right. But directly either on components or on fields. So when you were complaining about the extreme nesting that you were having, yeah. that would allow you, for instance, to add buttons the same way you're doing to the edit frame, but you are adding them directly to, let's say, the text field. So when they select text, they are getting there some extra buttons, but only on that field. Uh, that's in tomorrow's presentation. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, that's, I wasn't aware of them, so ah, okay, that's, that's a good one to, uh, to know. Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, I was going to say that the, uh, the use of item ideas as data sources, yeah. uh, that's coming soon. It's very, it's very soon, and it, actually we are um, adding some extra functionality in that area, which is going to be quite good. To say more those, uh, that's good to know. Do you know roughly how long? Soon. Shorter than six months, that's for sure. No. Six weeks? <laughs> that's within six months, so yes. Between <laughs> I mean, six weeks and six months. Okay. <laughs> you had a question down this end. Um, did, you, did the tool allow you to do demographic targeting, or did you have to create a number per demographic? The, for the scope of what we're doing here, we didn't actually need to target different different groups. One of the things we're going to, I think, probably add into it over the next few weeks is the notion that you could add regions of the page that were targeted to specific people, but that would be geared around the third-party tool they're using that would say, if there's these special tags in, this is the sort of banner we'll show to male users or female, that sort of thing. It, there wasn't, within the scope of kind of what we did, it didn't make use, like I said, it didn't make use of DMS or anything like that, so it's, what you see there is very static, but depending on what's sending the emails, 
that really will be where you kind of manipulate the, the different demographic of that sort of thing. Um, we can actually open page editor and ask about a question regarding yep. the in there. We should, be, should have it open. If you go to advanced tab and click details. Um, yeah, basically, if you can uh, go to scroll down a little bit, and go to edit. Yep. In here, yeah. And go to controls. Yeah. But actually, uh, normally, well, sometimes there is a scenario when you have to go here and replace, for example, some rendering or some layout with a different one. Yeah. But, for example, uh, maybe you're a person who is not aware of this particular project and actual base page layout, and it would be really nice to have a tree view rather than a list view here. So you sort of see your controls less Yeah, here. basically, yeah. So I, I can see actually, basically... Um, these are the how the controller are, are nested, so where are exactly it's going to be nested into, because sometimes it's really important to see. I guess, um, unfortunately, these examples possibly don't exploit that because they're all flat. We, we only had placeholders at a root level. Mm -hmm. Do you mean if, you, if your keys were more sort Yeah, of, for example, in reality, in the actual life projects, we have actually, for example, five levels nesting. That sort of thing. Yeah, so, but here they are all actually and on the same level, so you can get which one is nested to which one, and sometimes the placeholders are the same name, and yeah. you really can't get which one you would like to modify. I, thought, I mean, that, that, that's not something we need, we've needed to do in the past. I think that might be a good question for like, these guys there. Yeah, is, is, is there any, <laughs> any, any plans to, to, do, to change this to the tree view? Yeah, the, the reason is I use the tree not using it anyway. I'm your user as a developer, actually. Uh, yeah, but you can do it through site for growth, which actually depopulates your um, your placeholder um, names. So that's, I wouldn't use this interface. This interface, in my opinion, it should be uh, taken out uh, in the future version. Because um, as a user, you do it through uh, the page editor. Mm -hmm. as, as a developer, you do it through site for growth. That's my two cents on it. That it could be uh, rendered in a better way so that it's uh, displayed. Yes, it could. Yeah, but for example, if I'm, for example, a UI tester and I have no Visual Studio installed, what's what's that? You are sorry, what is that? Yeah, for example, UI interface tester for user experience, for example. Yeah. I would like to replace some control with another one. You can use page editor. Uh, maybe in that scenario, page editor doesn't work for this. What? So, I don't know, maybe uh, also can, 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 can it kind of somehow. You should make a page editor work. I think that's the uh, I'm not a developer, I'm just a tester. I'm like, let's see what will happen then. The developer so, should have made page editor work. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a test, it's a testing scenario. Yeah, yeah so for example, this, for example, this control makes the page, basically the page actually fail to render. Yeah. And I would like to replace it. I can't load it in the editor. That's why, because it's already put there, and it's made page rendering to fail. That's why I have to go to details and replace it there. But I can't get because I have the same basic placeholder for multiple actually layouts, sub layouts, and I don't know which one to replace. And this is the confusion. Okay, that's interesting. Just for your information, there's a version of Cycle Rocks that doesn't require Visual Studio, but that's just a by the Yeah, I see. But yeah, um, so so but it would be nice to have it here. As a tree view, I mean. So just I to see, see the nested. Yeah. In, in some respects, when you're in the page editor and you click on the dependencies to scroll up and you're in the context buttons, it does show it in the tree view. Yeah, I mean, but I do wholly agree with Raoul that they are to two different purposes, but you may have a Yeah, exactly. But you know that's the unique scenario. Yeah, for example, you added some control but which yeah. may actually all page to fail to render. And you cannot see the page editor because it fails. Yeah. And uh, so that's what then you have to use actually the details. If you manage to, to, to go into the UI and change it, let me know if you want to show it, we can stick on the marketplace. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a fair, fair request, but in reality, <laughs> like Al says, they are for two different purposes. And nice to have in some respects. Pat Rao can uh, know that over. I think that's inside the thing. I mean, we, we haven't needed to do that. Yeah. So, so I haven't got six. Okay, any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Nick.
have one last slide to stick in front of your face. Yes, I have uh, something to offer you. 